Well, um, glad to be here. Um, and if we could turn down the lights. Uh, thank you, Gail, for that great introduction. Um, so we'll start with uh, an image uh, from the California landscape. Um, and and I, I'll kind of use this to talk about um, what, what, um, what I'll be discussing this evening. Uh, this is um, a very unique landscape in Death Valley uh, called the Racetrack. And it's a, a water-leveled landscape uh, that's a mile and a quarter long by um, three quarters of a mile wide. And there's this, it, it's kind of known as the racetrack because the Desert Shoshone would race, uh, the men uh, and boys of the Shoshone tribe would race their ponies up and down this uh, mud playa, and that's how it got its name, the racetrack. But it's kind of known now more for these moving rocks, which is a, a particular phenomenon that um, I would venture to guess it happens in this place and only this place on the planet. And, you know, I'm not sure if Andy Goldsworthy was here, but uh, what's interesting is this is a hanging valley that sits uh, above the big death valley. So it's a big, big air mass, and there's this hanging valley. There's a mountain to the south here that deposits rocks. And then there's this gap between the big death valley and this hanging valley that creates what I think is a venturi that in certain weather conditions, uh, the wind uh, is intensified at that venturi. And with a thin raft of ice, uh, they're pretty sure now a thin raft of ice, it sails these rocks north across the playa. So, you know, what I think think is important for this, I guess, is, uh, you know, I'm someone that does study the desert. Uh, I, uh, I really learned how to see uh, going to the desert. Uh, this is, you know, the, a specificity of condition that determines something. And I'm interested that in the specificity of place and how that how we might read place, how we might use the context of a particular place as material. And so I'll, I'll start um, reading uh, something that just maybe kicks off the lecture, is that um, context by definition is somewhat inconclusive and thus is always open to personal interpretation. Place and how one reads it is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. But in my view as architects, it is our utmost responsibility to hone the necessary skills to interpret, unearth, represent, frame, and manifest meaningful, memorable, soulful places for our clients, our constituents, and our communities. Hopefully ones that possess the latent ability to sustain the whims of fashion and so, you know, to me, this might be reading the climate of a place, the light of a place, or the material culture of a place. Uh, I think um, Gail did a pretty good job of uh, kind of telling you a little bit about my background. I, I come from a kind of learning by doing. I went to Taliesin. I don't have a degree. I have a high school diploma. I really went on a path of doing it um, uh, through uh, direct experience and learning from that direct experience. Uh, this is the first thing that I did, uh, that I built, uh, was this uh, kind of distillation of the typical uh, sheep herder's tent that you were given at Talies. and it you, you were normally given a concrete slab, a wood frame, and these four poles and this pyramid of white canvas. I got rid of the, the wood frame and formed the slab to the shape of the tent, four anchor bolts, one in each corner, bent the poles, drilled a hole, tried to distill the tent 
uh, down, and then with some Velcro, this is how I would sleep with this kind of cross ventilation and pack rats kissing you at kissing you goodnight, uh, sleeping on the floor of the desert. Um, I also, uh, when I went to work with uh, Will Bruder, I, I was in Nashville, that's where I was born and raised, and I kind of fell in love with the desert. I knew I wanted to come back. And I came back to work in Bruder's studio in New River, and this is where I lived, which was Paulo Soleri's Dome in the Desert that was uh, kind of famously published in 1949 in Architectural Forum. It's actually a project that I emulated when I was 13 years old, and I studied this project at the Nashville Public Library. Uh, my time with Bruder culminated in uh, this project. Uh, I spent six years as co-designer project field architect on the Phoenix Central Library, and we had the opportunity to do this building for our city, and I decided to delay uh, leaving his practice and kind of stayed on uh, another six years uh, beyond the five that I... I, I probably would have left after five if it wasn't for this building. Now, where I practice, uh, you know, we have this uh, really amazing Sonoran Desert landscape that is around Phoenix and something that I, I grew up with at Taliesin West. But where I practice is in the fifth largest city in America. So it's a, it's a city in the making. I think that's why I'm interested in working there. It's a city that isn't made yet. It's starting to cook. Uh, it's starting to simmer. Um, it's, uh, who knows, it, you know, it's definitely not going to be a European city. It's going to be something else. Um, my first project that was, Gail mentioned my seminal work, is my studio, was it at the time my studio and a residence. Now it's just a, a, my residence. And it's at the base of the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. It's one of these sites that, uh, you know, a young architect could afford $27,000 for a quarter acre. And these were the first sketches that I did when I walked that site. It, it was a, a very narrow site that was cut in half by an, an old road. And so the solution was a kind of band-aid that would render the site whole again and these are the first sketches. I often think in section, and then I'm also thinking about construction. And so, because I was paying for it, I was thinking about it a little more. Uh, and so the idea was a 580 case backhoe that could dig a footing line on the south, a footing line on the north, and we would erect these monoliths and then span the house between. We would drive into the house, we would have this kind of canyon experience, which is the kind of first experience. You would hear the sound of water. There would be this kind of microclimate. There would be a public volume that's on the street and a private volume that sleeps at the floor of the desert. And to, we, I kind of searched for what would those monoliths be. And this is, uh, I mean, clearly a, a work that's inspired by early travels to, to Europe, uh, uh, visiting Stonehenge for the first time, and also travels here to L.A. and to the Schindler's King's Roadhouse. And so this idea of monoliths, uh, it, it first started out as cast-in-place concrete, and that didn't work structurally. It didn't work thermally. So I found... After a lot of research, I found the material for that idea, which was a proprietary system that had just been invented by Superlight Block, which is a local block company that created the, the kind of standard now for America, which is a lightweight concrete block that doesn't break the back of a mason. And the innovation here, if, you've, if, if you notice, there are no end cells. There's only a two-third height middle cell. And so it's about reducing thermal wicking from the exterior face to the interior face by 66%. And then the walls are pumped with foam. And then they're post-tensioned with a 7 16 inch diameter all-thread rod and a compression washer and a plate washer. And that 
post tensions the wall. So it's a kind of it's kind of a contemporary um, and let's say a more intelligent adobe. So because on our desert it doesn't work like the old deserts. We have what's called an urban heat island effect. Our nighttime lows are not as low as they used to be. They're they're about 10 to 15 degrees hotter. So you really you know was looking at a walled architecture of the southwest and how do we maybe do something that's appropriate in that regard, but also how is it an insulated construction. So it became this kind of, uh, my mason called it a skyscraper of the desert. Uh, so this is a conventionally reinforced 12816 12, masonry. And then from here up is no grout. That's just a post-tension skeletal frame of face shells and that's an R28 wall, and it really does work. So it's a kind of cantilevered, hybridized moment frame. It's completely open in this direction. So the kind of rule of the project became that all the partitions that are perpendicular to the monoliths are about allowing light to move through the length of the volume. This is a kind of the, the street porch. Uh, this is a kind of sleeping at the floor of the desert. The space between that is the kind of entry into the house, which is a, a kind of a steeper cadence of concrete and then a, a, a kind of a more gradual cadence of steel stepping stones and kind of this canyon uh, experience. And one of the monoliths pushes out to create a winter terrace. This is the view um, driving in. I wish this was my Porsche. Um, but um, this was my cost estimator's car. <laughs> He's a little better with money than I was. Uh, and he had a collection of Porsches, so I was able to choose this one, which I, I thought it said carport more than my Honda CRX at the time. Uh, the, there's, you can see kind of the way the house kind of works like a series of blinders and a horse. It's kind of focusing view to the mountain preserve, which is to the east, and a kind of editing the context. I have neighbors that are literally 40 feet either side of me. And so it was about editing that context, focusing that view. Um, here, this kind of reflecting pool that we use religiously as a kind of plunge pool, especially in the summer. So every night before bed, taking a dip in that pool, this is this kind of canyon view what I call my poor man's Pilkington. And from the street, that project uh, led to, I, I was doing that project while the Central Library was happening. So I was building the Central Library and building that project evenings and weekends while doing the Central Library. And out of that project, I got this project, which I called the Dialogue House which was around the corner. I kind of I like a project that you might be able to describe with a sketch or with your hands. Um, this project is about two elemental volumes, one that is focused to the city, one that is focused to the sky. One is about warm light. One is about cool light. It's also a concept to resort living that if you want to Go for a swim, you might put a towel over your shoulder and you descend into this space that is only a view to the sky. So I kind of say it's kind of everything, nothing. It's a kind of a, a, a dialectic between these things. These are some early renderings. Uh, very, uh, what I mean by early renderings is not early in the project. I mean early renderings. Uh, this, is, uh, you, this is like really was super sophisticated when it was done. Uh, this was uh, thinking about, because my clients both own their own businesses and they worked a lot, is it designing the house for the magic hour, uh, for a life after work. And so it had this amazing view to the city skyline. It was not a ski jump site where you were way above the view. You were just above it enough where the skyline kind of stacked up and started to look like a real city. 
The other idea of the project is that it would recede into the night and the apparent thinness of light would support space. This was uh, the view to the pool. And so when we, we had a, a really generous corner lot, there was a high point on the site, so the living room would sit up on the high point. Uh, there was a lot of short car, shortcut arterial traffic that moved through here on the way to downtown in this kind of mountain community. And so we saw the extents of the property, that the extents of the property was the mountain range, the South Mountain Range and the Sierra Australia Mountain Range. And so we wanted to actually extend the, that view. And so we had this idea, this volume of light out in the landscape. It was walled so that it could be a private space. These are some finished images of this project, uh, kind of walking along this wall that's a, a pinwheel that is part of a pinwheel strategy that laterally braces this box. One of the pinwheels takes you out to the pool. You can see the nature of the kind of 50s, 60s bungalow houses. Uh, so when you're in the pool, you don't see that. This is the kind of dialogue between the two volumes. Uh, the finish is about this geology. So the stucco volume is also dialoguing with this geology, which is interesting. This is a desert. It's called desert varnish, which is um, essentially living organisms on the rock that are a self-shading self strategy for the rock. And you know, Native Americans chipped into this and created petroglyphs. But that, that was kind of informing that finish. Sorry. Um, and then this is uh, descending down into the pool, which is a volume that is half terrace, half water. And then this is the, the kind of looking back at the house and then looking out to, to the city skyline. The, the planes coming into Sky Harbor. Um, this is like a slow motion animation film of wind activated refracted light. So it's, it's, it's moving. It's like a kind of a light water fireplace out in the landscape. So, Later, uh, we had the opportunity to do a public project uh, on the heels of the Central Library, which uh, showed you earlier, and kind of working with the City of Phoenix Library System, which is one of the great library systems in the country. And this was a project that I got with uh, the local firm of Gould Evans. Uh, it was a joint venture project. And this was in this community that is uh, kind of legendary uh, it's known as Maryvale. It's kind of the western version of Levittown. So it's one of the epicenters of urban sprawl. And it's a community that's about 50 years old now. It used to be a very idyllic place. Uh, when we got this project, the park, this park, Maryvale Park, um, was um, the highest teen crime area in Arizona. And there were murders in this park. And the original developer, John F. Long, got this project bonded. Um, and the idea was to do a new community center and a new library. Uh, this is a kind of the original Maryvale community was uh, actually master planned by Victor Gruen in the 50s. And what John F. Long did is he built one of the first malls in America. There was, uh, he built all the infrastructure, like hospitals, parks, and then later the housing happened. Um, and this was the site as we found it. Uh, there was a library, a branch library, dying behind a dead mall. This mall was dead. The north half had done some adaptive reuse as a middle school and an elementary school. Um, the, lot, the community center was quite small, only 5,000 square feet. There was an existing pool, which was the largest public pool in Phoenix. 
And early feasibility studies said that you would, would to get all the parking for this new 43,000 square foot program, you would have to get rid of the ball field. So we thought that was a bad way to get off with the community, to, uh, kind of getting off on the wrong foot with the community. So we uh, did something really uh, mundane. We set our staff in the parking lots of community centers, pools, and libraries, and counted cars. And we went for a zoning variance on the parking. We created an intergovernmental agreement with the school district to the south. And we were able to reduce the parking from 650 cars to 250 cars. We were able to save not only the ball field, but all of the recreational square footage of the park. And it was really about preserving existing green space, because we felt there was enough asphalt in the city. And where we did have to do asphalt for the parking, we had the idea that um, maybe we should shade the parking. So we shaded the parking with the namesake tree of this library, the Palo Verde Library, so with Palo Verde trees. So what you're seeing is the library is associated with this corner park as a kind of window into the site and working with the contemplative nature of the park. The community center is associated with the ball field and the pool, the parking kind of pinwheels in this manner, there's a promenade that connects this, this street to all the functions of the park. And one of the things we were excited about, kind of going into the interview when we went after the project, is that it was a mixed-use program. So it was a 27,000 square foot community center and a 16,000 square foot branch library. We immediately saw that as the kind of exercise uh, we, a di we could do a dialogue about the exercise of the mind and the exercise of the body. So it became this kind of mind-body dialogue. And so this is kind of a finished image. But in plan, very early we discovered that the open collections of the library equaled the gymnasium, which was the thing that could possibly kind of take over the project. The scale of the gym could kind of take over the project. And we knew that between these two departments, the library department and the parks de par department, that we wanted to create a kind of a parity between those two departments. So we, we thought about these two similarly scaled volumes that they could kind of resonate with each other, kind of like a tuning fork. And it, this, you know, you would have this kind of cross-pollination between these programs. So the layout of the plan is these big box programs, which are projected to the street, and then an internal street that is connecting the library to the community center to the pool, and then the smaller bits of program are relegated to these smaller boxes on the west that kind of protect these larger boxes from the West Sun. So it was really looking at the kind of vernacular of our place, the kind of ubiquitous Circle K and how it projects its program to the street. We were kind of intent on, as you drive up and down this major arterial in Phoenix, that you would see into the program you would understand the civic mission of the building and the community. You would see people reading, you would see books, you would see people playing basketball, you would understand the building is for you. Here's what I was just describing in plan. The smaller bits of program are in these Integra masonry volumes, the internal street that threads between the smaller boxes and the big box programs. The big box program projecting to the street and looking at big box construction and how you might elevate that big box construction to, a, to something that uh, is more honorific, uh, more a public building. So this, um, this material was about a kind of reverse lantern in the park, that it would be 
registering the changing light qualities that are the kind of deep context of this place. So this is how we were thinking about context. It's not necessarily the context of the buildings, but also the context of the light. And how do you presence that light that has always been really phenomenal? I mean, this is a typical day in Phoenix. No clouds, blue sky. It's a kind of amazing canvas for colored air. And to presence that colored air in the skin. And we really didn't need all that light in this library. We needed bottom light and we needed top light. And so the section of the building is about uh, delivering really well-balanced, glare-free light. And we only needed this much window because it was about projecting that program. Also, we wanted the park to look like it could move through the building. So this is the, this is the corner park, the hospital. Um, this was an image of the park moving through the building. The materiality is four foot wide by 24 foot high by eight inch thick mill finished stainless steel. And this is a public budget. We had the idea that we knew that metal comes in four foot coil, so we, we knew it's often sheared into four by eight sheets. So we said, let's shear it every 24 feet. Let's palletize it, bring it to the job site, and minimize shop labor. We were able to do this skin from the exterior gyp sheathing out, including the self-healing waterproof membrane, the mill finished steel at 8 inch thick. We were able to do that for $20 a square foot, about $5 a square foot more than drive it, painted drive it. So it was about doing a maintenance-free kind of lifetime finish that is the poetic of the project. So there was a kind of understanding of how we might achieve this and working with a metal contractor that we've developed a very good relationship with. Um, here's the kind of liquidity of that, that skin. And it's... It is a rain screen, so any, it it's already has a high albedo rating because of its reflectance. But it's uh, ventilating any water that gets in the system that com it comes out. I guess the, the one thing I forgot to mention is it's 40% less energy to produce mill-finished stainless steel. It's 40% um, less expensive. Why it doesn't have a finish? It's not brushed. It's not polished. There's no energy in finishing it. The finish is the stainless steel pig being pressed into a sheet good. And it only happens between 7 and 12 gauge. So we're taking the rawest form of the material, which is, you know, how we were able to achieve the budget. Here you can see the top light, the bottom light, the kind of, there's a really beautiful quality of light. Uh, the air, the conditioning of the air is at the, the window. It's, we're only conditioning where the body is. We're letting the rest of the space stratify. This is a kind of descriptive section that talks about the performance of the building. This talks about the unit system of the building, which I, uh, the house you might have noticed, and it would be here as well. I kind of use this, uh, what I call the tatami mat of America, which is a four by eight module. That, so so the, there's a kind of eight foot zone. The big box is 32 foot high. These are 16 foot high. The joist are 12 and 24. A lot of the materials are coming in these modules that work with that. This is the kind of big box construction. It's a target store, basically, except that We've lifted the skirt of the building up to allow this window that's projecting program to the street. Uh, this is, uh, we've all seen fabric face bat insulation in a big box store. We've seen these solid tubes, but we, we decided to make that black. So the thermal insulation is also the acoustic absorber. 
Uh, these are the light fixtures for the room. And then this wrapper is, uh, is an idea of working with a material that has the effect of kind of handmade paper books that are open. And so we're, we're using this material, which is oriented strand board, which is you know, kind of now the plywood sheathing that is often used. We actually found the factory in Canada that uses predominantly aspen. And in like two seconds, these panels are sanded. You can get them sanded. You can get them without the, the span index. And so we, were, we felt that that material had the quality of handmade paper. Um, just to bump, jump back to this image, the reason the paper books, so in plan, they're, they're like pages. And then they're tilted. And that is about taking the parallel surfaces out of parallel five degrees, so you're reducing reverberation time. So it's a kind of an acoustic device to reduce reverberation time, but it's also kind of giving a warmth to the space. There's a kind of, this is the kind of mind-body dialogue, kind of a final image. Also the warm light of the recycled rubber wood uh, gym floor, working with that, uh, the wrapper inside the library that I was just talking about. Uh, I guess one thing just to mention about this building, it's the highest used public branch library in the Phoenix Library System. It's the highest use of any community center in the, the, the Phoenix System. It's something that uh, the Parks Department, they resisted the glass. They re resisted projecting that program to the street. They thought there would be drive-by shootings and people you know, dead on the gym floor. Uh, their normal uh, community center is a cell block of masonry with every, it, like stenciled lettering that, that is like you take a paint can and you spray the name of the project on the cell block. And, and what, what happens is those typical community centers in Phoenix, they're territorialized where one will be Hispanic, one will be black, one will be white. Uh, the behavior of the, the space generates bad behavior. We, we felt we could create a safer, less marginalized, less territorialized uh, community center by using transparency. And it, it really, really is working. OK, I'm going to jump. You know, halfway across the country to a little house that is um, in this area right here. It's in uh, what's known as the Grand Chute, which is the last retreating North American glacier that created the thumb of Wisconsin. Uh, we call it the Field House. The I one idea of this house was that it would sit in the landscape as a kind of object of utility that would not reveal its purpose until up close. So the north and west, there's hardly any penetrations because the northwest winter winds are really brutal. Uh, you drive across this 16-acre cornfield against a hedgerow of trees that actually is surrounding the west and north side of the project. So we sided the house at the top of the hill against this existing hedgerow. Uh, you kind of drive across a wetland and aside an apple orchard, which is a memory piece for my client's father. And then you arrive in, in this space on the south. And so it's, it's a kind of barn, a loft barn that is viewing this <coughs> ever-changing landscape of soybeans, of corn. It's different every year because it's feed crop. It's for feed crops for the dairy cattle. And so it, it's very simply a 96 foot long, 24 foot wide, 32 foot high box. And it's clad in 16 inch wide industrial roll form siding in vertical and horizontal configuration. 
What you're seeing here is a screen porch that is embedded in that, in that very simple volume. You, you move from kind of a darker quality of light uh, that's kind of the black earth of Wisconsin up into this loft barn where the structure is exposed and you're just above the field. And this is the screen porch. Uh, these are some beautiful chairs that my client selected by Jasper Morrison. You can have an espresso here and a scone here. Kind of enjoy the morning sun. This is looking east. Um, this is the block that we were able to get there, which is just the standard basic block, but it's the tightest, some of the tightest block I've ever seen. It's like using this kind of really white Carrera-like limestone that they have up there. And this is only a 10% coal. All the joints, the bed joints and head joints are raked so that it really looks like you're laying stone. This is bathing in the lower level. This is bathing in the upper level, kind of this glaciated light. And... From the screen porch, you can walk all the way down this 96-foot volume into the study and up this silo ladder to an observatory. My client is an amateur astronomer uh, with a master's degree in astrophysics from MIT. He went to Stanford to get his doctorate in astrophysics and decided he wasn't as smart as those guys and he went into oncology instead. But he's uh, still into the stars, and he wanted to be able to walk on the roof. So uh, Red, the building inspector, never went up here. Um, and so he didn't wonder about this uh, smoking bench that's uh, for my client. Um, this kind of meets OSHA. You kind of have to make an effort to walk through there. Uh, and this is the, this kind of, I don't know, this form of kind of glaciated light against the hedgerow. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, you smell this field. It's really, the sustenance here is really palatable. And then, um, this warm light um, of home emanating from that cool volume. Another field condition project that uh, we had the, uh, the honor of being invited to compete on a little uh, competition with actually a bunch of my colleagues and friends. It was for the For Falling Water, um, a series of scholar cottages, six scholar cottages. And this, this project is um, it's, it's very similar to my house in that it's a kind of single stroke solution. So it was looking at the tradition up and down this, this road. You probably all know Falling Water as Mill Run, Pennsylvania. And so there's all these mills. It's, it's all the great hardwoods come from this forest in, in North America. So there's a big concentration of mills, an amazing forest. The falling water is managed by the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. So they're more of a conservancy. And they wanted to get rid of these monocultures of spruce that had been planted after World War I when everybody went to Germany and thought the Black Forest was a real forest and this was not worth keeping. So they're now trying to get rid of these monocultures. So we thought, let's look at solid timber construction. So the, 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 the floor, the walls, the roof is a solid timber construction. We thought that one of the, the, the most potent memories of this place would be walking across this field the Kirkpatrick field, and that you would, you know, that would be your memory is just like walking across this field. You know, that's where the dining was going to be at this existing house over here. These would be embedded into the ecotone of the landscape, this edge condition between forest and field. 
you would step on this platform, you would move into this space. These were sleeping berths for students. Um, these were the, this is the one private room and private bathroom. This is a model here kind of showing that we were using just the act of putting this very simple cabin into the forest. We used the forest as the overhang. We used the forest as the thing that shades the cabin. And we, we knew this field is going to superheat in the summer, so we siphon uh, cool breezes from Bear Run, from the forest, through the house. And that was all a strategy about how to get this view in a responsible way, kind of under the overhang of the forest, across the field to the Alleghenies. OK, I'm going to jump back to the desert. Uh, this is a collaboration, uh, kind of a dream project that um, there were th three of us that were contacted, uh, Marwan Al Said, who's now practicing here in Santa Monica, was practicing at Phoenix at the time, and Rick Joy in Tucson and myself were approached to do a hotel on this site. So it's a kind of a dream project, 1,400-acre Horseshoe Canyon. Uh, the way you enter this project is you drive around the backside. You kind of are slung down along this sand dune. And you come around the tip of this lone rock here that's 170 feet high. These cliffs are 800 feet high. And this was the site that Adrian Zecca, the, the kind of visionary of Amman Resorts, uh, picked out. So this is us uh, with Adrian on the site the first day that we learned that this was the site. It was a site that we, we had been on this site a lot, but he found this site that none of us had ever seen. This image tells you this is how you look at sunsets. You actually look east what we call reverse sunsets in the West. This is the, the finished project, which was conceived as a mass ruin akin to the landscape, so the, that it, it would be eroded instead of by wind and water, it would be eroded by the movement of the body. And that as you're moving in this abstraction of the landscape, it would feel like you're walking in the landscape. So this is, um, you know, it was kind of an unusual idea that we were trying to, we were telling uh, the, Adrian bought it completely the first time, but the people paying for it, I would say, were not so sure about casting a destination resort in concrete. You know, they, they thought of jails and other things. Um, this is a, a camera that, it, as you walk across this point, which is a kind of hinge between the room bars, you, you end up panning the landscape, kind of like a Western movie. That, that occurs uh, here and a couple of other places. This is the plan. So there was a kind of natural spot here for a rival we always felt when we studied the site, and we thought it was logical to hug this rock and to place the building against this rock. And we, we had this very sensual landscape of frozen Entrada sandstone that had been weathered by the wind and by water. So this kind of hard-edged construction we knew it could work against the kind of soft sensuality of the existing landscape. There was a discussion about how it, at these resorts, you, you always, you might want to gather. So you might want the solitary experience of the desert, which we were very intent on creating. But you also might come together. So there was an idea of a piazza, which became a 
living room pool that engages this rock. And then we decided that all the rooms would be on the desert floor, this kind of sophisticated uh, camping. So you, it's like, I don't know, you circle the wagons and you create a little settlement and you have this kind of solitary experience with the desert. There were other ideas about um, star baths and sky beds and the living room was this idea of it was a discussion with the guy that originally got us involved in the project and he was talking about being in Mozambique and being stationed in Mozambique and being in this jungle and and then hearing all these jungle noises and then off in the distance hearing this little transistor radio that was uh, broadcasting Radio Free Europe. And he was talking about the juxtaposition between the man-made and the natural. And what evolved out of those discussions was this thought that the nature of wildness is reinforced precisely by the insertion of the man-made. But we wanted that to be very, very crisp, like beyond that settlement, the settlement they were creating, this kind of, this, that's its wildness beyond that plane and the juxtaposition between those two. So this was the site, uh, it was uh, like a Michael Heiser in scale, it's 1,100 feet long. The concrete was a very interesting uh, pursuit of what, what was the right material that would be the abstraction of the geology of this place. We, we went through a lot of different ideas and finally came to concrete. We used um, local sands and aggregates. We had a local, we had a batch plant on site. Most of the materials came within a very close radius of the site. Um, used a fly ash from the Navajo coal burning plant nearby. But the most important thing is the, the, the idea that we would cast the concrete against um, this product called Finform, which is 14-ply uniform white birch uh, with a phenolic resin. It's the same product that Lou Kahn used, that Tadao Ando uses. But the reason we were using it is this thing we knew happened with that material is that it would give us a reflective finish when you're oblique to the surface. And the reason that was important to us is we wanted the surface of the walls to act like the cliffs beyond. And the cliffs beyond are essentially silica. They're sandstone, they're little pieces of sand, they're little pieces of glass that are reflecting and ref Practicing light and always changing with the changing qualities of light. So this is as the sun is gone down and the building is kind of receding with the cliffs. And then here in the middle of the day, this wall is reflecting the blue sky or reflecting the cliffs or the body moving through the space. So. It's funny, the travel writers, after a while, started saying that we've colored the walls different colors. It, 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 no, it's just the walls are changing with the, the way that they were cast. This is how we looked at the interiors, which we also designed for this project. There's wind kind of presenced in the project. This is uh, the entry, you're looking up to that 170 foot high rock, and that's the art, the view is just always a changing painting. This is the pool that engages a rock. This is a squall coming in to the site, and Another thing that really drove this project was a poem by Octavio Paz, Wind, Water, and Stone. This is, this is that poem happening. And it kind of 
can rip apart the resort sometimes. This would not be your typical travel shot, but I think it kind of says everything about this project. The seeing the rock wet like that. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, it's completely dry again. The rooms, the star bath, the, as you walk into the mass, you hear water trickling, you smell water. Uh, the, at some point, we were challenged with budget issues, and we had to co contemplate deleting a little wood gate here. The client said, yeah, why not just a rope? So we looked at the traditions of um, the Spanish traditions of weaving horsehair. Uh, so those types of things about place uh, can be brought into the project, not only the big idea of the project, but at the scale of the hand. Uh, the furniture is woven rawhide that is ratcheted down a number of inches to be more horizontal, more with the horizon. This was the graphics. Uh, you might have noticed the graphics a little earlier was this idea of branding and the traditions of branding, and that was brought into the project. This is the most kind of sensual part of the site, which is... Uh, where we decided to place the spa, which was conceived as a series of tumbled forms that create um, opportunity to actually remove the landscape, to kind of be regenerated and then go back into the landscape anew. The concept for those massage rooms were uh, the interior of a, of a, Navajo, a Navajo Hogan. And Actually, this is one of those scripts that I guess it's important to mention. We kind of designed this project through narrative. We described to ourselves as we were designing the project uh, the stories that people might take back with them. And one we actually forgot the first day we, the, when we were here for the opening, um, this Navajo masseuse told us about how she, you know, walked into this space and she started crying and it, because it reminded her of her grandmother's Hogan. And I guess one thing that I really firmly believe is that architecture does have the capacity to communicate to people at a visceral level, at a gut level. And, you know, it's something that I think matters is how we create architecture that resonates with people, uh, that they, they, they don't need the script. They get the script even though they never read it. We're doing, uh, actually Marwan Alsaid and I are doing a couple of other Amans. This is uh, waiting for funding a project in British Columbia, a, a landscape of water that is um, uh, the first major fjord north of Vancouver, uh, which is uh, 20 minutes by seaplane from the, sea, the uh, Vancouver airport. And we felt with this site it, that you can land in this what's, what's called dark cove. It's a very placid cove. There's quite a high tidal fluctuation that happens. There's because it's so placid, there's a lot of bird life here. So we felt that where you really wanted to be was around this cove. And yet that's where the most precious forest is. It's a kind of first growth forest. So there's an idea of a boardwalk uh, that's very similar to places of culture like Lake Como and also around uh, Vancouver. And the concept for the project is a tower suite. So you take out one tree, which is transplanted to a living room. These are prefabricated. They're barged in. And it's a vertical suite so that each floor is, is a particular program. So living, bathing, and sleeping under the stars. 
The, the materiality is a charred cedar that is about working with the shadows of this landscape. Another project which is in, on the big island of Hawaii, and a lot of times in these projects we know that the most memorable experiences are what could be the most memorable experience because you spend a lot of time doing it, is walking between the room and between your guest room and getting some food or going to the pool. Or, and so that, how do you make that experience really memorable? And in, in Hawaii, there's this kind of Malka Makai where traditionally all land ownership, every family owned a piece of the sea and a piece of the mountain. So if you look at early land division and it's, also determined by the lava flows. Uh, it's all about this, this Malka to Makai relationship. So we wanted to like feel that with our feet and, and to feel that always as you're, you're in the resort. These are grass. This is a very atypical part of Hawaii. It's the driest part of Hawaii. It only rains six inches. It's the same as Phoenix. It's like you're in, you're north of Johannesburg in a savanna landscape of grasses and karidi trees that are similar to mesquites. Another project that uh, Marwan and I did together is a resort uh, competition in Qatar. The concept was a paradisia, a paradise, a paradise garden that's walled, that's floating and the water infiltrates the project. So every room is connected to the water and to the desert. And there's this kind of paradise garden in the middle that is engaged by the spa. Also, um, the, there's a kind of masharabia that is housing an aviary. So the, the paradise garden is not just about um, Flora, it's also about fauna. So I'm very close to the end, um, and I want to read one last thing. Um, so let me turn on a light. Um, so I... Really is, uh, I would say, thanks to Will Bruder, I was turned on to landscape art, uh, something that I wasn't aware of, um, but uh, it's definitely influenced my work. Um, not surprisingly, the context of a site is often most holistically interpreted and presented to us by historians and artists through a systematic yet very personal process of tapping into the soul of a place. Artists for some time have been constructing installations that dialogue with context in a way that is specific to the qualities of place. And I'll, I'll show you some images from Donald Judd's Marfa, Texas. And you know, if you know anything about Marfa, here's an artist that kind of got fed up with the kind of New York art scene and art being not well curated in museums. And he decided to do the largest museum on the planet by going to Marfa and inviting artists to do work here. So it's his work plus his friends. But he says something in an interview with uh, a writer, Bill Wright, that, uh, that it was his dream to create art that resonated with space and light, to place it where space and light would never be tamed and distorted with development and pollution. So he wanted to do art that was very specific to the qualities of place. So I, I'm going to, I'll close with, um, I'll try to go a little quicker here with a project that we just finished out on the edge of our city, at the, the edge between the city and the desert. We call it Desert Courtyard House. And it's, um, this, is a, this is an early sketch. And 
you can read this, but I'll, I'll maybe read it for you. It's mass, hollowed mass, faceted mass, fissured mass, mass that cracks open and hinges apart informed how we proceeded to give this, this home its, its defining qualities from the courtyard plan to the split massing all the way down to the fitting and fixtures that one touches with the hand or the eye. On this site, it was a kind of what I would call not a king of the hill site. It, 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 it did have this amazing view to the west. It had these somewhat unusual things on it, like these volcanic rocks on the left. This, what we fondly called arrow rock that had a flat face for a fire. We developed around some of those very small things, really. We developed a courtyard plan that was kind of our Japanese ngawa, kind of a, in this case, a glazed veranda that always is looking into this courtyard and then the house spirals up and out to the view. So in section, it's, um, it's, it's a kind of monocline that is, un, is kind of constantly moving you up to this most honorific view. The base of the house is a plinth that's battered on its outsides and sandblasted to work with the refracted light that is similar to the decomposed granite on the site. The horizontal portion of the plant, and sometimes in the plant, we've ground it. So it's a kind of polished concrete that is presencing the geology of this place through the Salt River aggregate. Here's actually carving a stair in the plant. And then on top of the plant, we took the excavation and put it into the wall so there's no export or import. All the rammed earth is from the site, and we're presencing light as an artifact in these walls. This is a, a, a shot under construction. The house is a peninsula. It's on a peninsula, and it's surrounded by washes. And this wash, uh, which runs six months of the year, kind of heads right for the house and then turns. Right here is where uh, the, the house kind of cracks open and one side kind of falls down the slope and another, another part of the house lifts up. So here you can kind of see that it's spiraling from a lower point all the way to the most honorific point where there's arrow rock. And then this is uh, what I was just saying a minute ago about that even the cabinets are about uh, the big idea. They're the, this kind of volumetric that's cracked open. Uh, so even the cabinet is defined by the big idea of the project. Here it is uh, kind of really receding into the landscape. You arrive from above. So we very much wanted the house to kind of recede as a deep shadow. And this is uh, entering into the mass. This is where it's kind of hinged open. Looking across the Ngawa, one part the Ngawa folds underneath you and you kind of walk over the desert. Uh, instead of the gallery being in the living room, it's pushed across the, the courtyard so that you're, there's a dialogue between these spaces now across the courtyard, between the entry and the library, between the living room and the gallery. So you're always kind of walking around this space. Here, are those, those volcanic rocks are right here. This wall was always here. The arrow rock is here. Here you can see how it's kind of spiraling up and out to the view. This is, uh, there's some very refined finishes within this kind of hard shell of concrete rammed earth and steel. And, and so there is 
a one log of Wenge that has been, um, all the veneer has been laid up into plywood panels, one and an eighth inch thick in horizontal and vertical grain. And it's highly reflective because it's a piano finish. This is the, the gallery, and we're kind of looking at the, the, where the house opens up in the reflection. These volcanic rocks, the kind of low winter light coming into the house. This is uh, the client mentioned they'd like to take a shower outside. So we had this idea that the wall would open sesame into a triangular faceted courtyard. This is some of the detail of the house, the, the stainless steel um, that's a non-directional finish and also a really uh, amazing collaboration with some interior designers that um, are like, they know the history of interior design like I know the history of architecture. Uh, very, very uh, great experience working with them. So, some final views of this project. This is a real sunset. <laughs> my, my photographer was a little worried that, you know, it just looks fake. It's too good. It's, uh, this was like, I don't, you know, it's like one of the best sunsets I've seen in like, 30 years, it was pretty amazing. Um, we're doing uh, these, this very quickly, there's a small housing project that is, uh, it's a volumetric masonry housing project that communicates uh, kind of a front yard and front porch to the street while also twisting and capturing a view of Camelback, uh, so the, the, the third level becomes the kind of living room with this kind of conceived as a balcony, um, playing with some details in the head joints. Another project which is about shade, another housing project. This is my studio uh, that Gail mentioned. Uh, we own this building on Central Avenue, which is the kind of main street of the city. We're going to do some housing on top of this someday. This is a little restaurant that uh, we did in our hood uh, that is an old architect's office that was built in the 50s. We don't get to work on a lot of old buildings in Phoenix because there are not a lot of old buildings in Phoenix. Uh, and so this one had some good bones. The, the floor was really springy. So instead of taking it out, we decided to help it out with this king post truss um, that is a kind of homemade thing, and th that takes you out to the watering hole, which is an indoor-outdoor bar on Camelback Road, which is a major street in Phoenix, and really great wood-fired cuisine. Um, I think about, I like food. I think about food a lot. Um, but what is interesting, I, I, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of really good chefs and we have we have a few in Phoenix uh, it's starting to as I mentioned it's starting to simmer as a city as a there's starting to be some culture but I always find it interesting talking to chefs because what they usually are talking about is their relationships with suppliers purveyors of food they're talking about proportion they're talking about timing so I think you know, it's very akin to what we do, that architecture is about relationships, uh, relationships with the craftsmen that we work with. Uh, it's about proportion. It's about timing. So I bet we're all hungry. That's someone calling, wondering, why aren't you at dinner? Anyway, um, thank you very much. I think we have time. There's a little reception that will follow, but I think we have time for one or two questions. If there's anything in the audience. Um, 
you talk a little bit, I mean, I know that site is really important, and even that last comment about working with uh, relationships with your um, consultants. Um, do you have any difficulties in terms of both the design and these relationships working on um, far away projects? I saw some of the projects were uh, um, in a distance quite far, quite far away where you were maybe experiencing the culture of the, mm -hmm. the people yeah. there. Well, you know, let, let's take the field house. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, um, one, one thing we do, I guess, you know, this dimension is, you know, I've been building for, a, a, you know, a long time and craft and building is very important to the work. So I've, I've learned that very early we need to involve contractors always in the project. I, you know, public projects, we can't sometimes avoid it. it, it it's kind of sometimes it, um, you don't know who you're going to be working with. But on a, on a, you know, to the degree that I can, I try to get a contractor involved early, even on the public work it's starting to happen with CM at risk and all that. So you, you get a chance to interview, usually, people. And so, like in the case of the field house, we went around with my client and looked at buildings that were well crafted and they weren't not necessarily contemporary buildings so they, they might have been some kind of you know neoclassical or but they were well crafted and we found out who those contractors were and then we went to them with the the schematic design and we interviewed those contractors and had to had them give us a kind of cost plus a fixed fee proposal and I convinced my client that we should, in, we should not do a kind of competitive bid. We shouldn't do a lump sum bid. It should be a cost plus a fixed fee. And let's get that fee f fixed from the beginning. And let's make it an open book, open bid situation. And so, I don't know, we're very proactive about how do we set that up for success. And, and you know, and then it was about... We, we found that general contractor and then about starting to develop relationships with subcontractors and involving them early in the project. And I think, you know, I learned this on the Phoenix Central Library and I learned this before working with, with Will is we, we did a lot of construction management where we were the contractors, essentially. It was, we were, you know, construction manager, but we're basically the contractor. So I, I I've just come from that background, and I find that the earlier we can start doing that, investing craftsmen in the design process, that we're much more successful bidding the projects and more, more successful getting everybody into it, you know. I mean, you know, we all talk about those times when, you know, you know, somebody's bringing their girlfriend to the site for the weekend, and, you know, they're, like, they're taking the stuff they normally do, but something else is happening with it you know they and and I don't believe for a second that there are no craftsmen out there they're out there they're out there wherever you go and you've got to find them and get them engaged and I find often they're just really chomping at the bit to to work on something interesting and to kind of honor what they do and what they can do so you know, we, we, we found that we have to, you know, we do have to make sure there's a process in place to work outside of our region and then, you know, make, make sure we're going to the site once a month and there are weekly meetings with images and things like that, so. Stephen. And one's hiding in the back here. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I'll let Marwan answer the question. Um, well, I, you know, we were, we were, we were, you know, I guess when we were asked, I mean, how it happened is there were some, the, this guy, Bernd Kuhlman, was talking to some bigger name architects. And he was also talking to Will Bruder, and Will was busy at the time. And he said, here's some other big names that you could talk to. 
or you could talk to three up-and-coming architects. And he gave our three names and a letter to this client. And he was intrigued by that idea. He drove down to Phoenix and then to Tucson. He saw our work. He then he liked our work. He liked all three of us. And he came back with us, came back to us with the unusual proposition, would we agree to work together on the project? And we were young enough and stupid enough to, to, to say yes. Uh, I think it, it, in hindsight, it was really good for us because we were very small, you know, young, and the project was like this. It was up and down, up and down, like it was on, and then they would spend like six months deciding if they wanted to do it, and then it was on again. And so, you know, if we had had one of our practices on the project, we would have probably gone, you know, kind of gone under. So we were able to, I think, put enough, like, from each of our practices on the project. There was, it was a very small team. Um, Howard Chu is sitting there with Marwan, who was part of that team. I mean, I think at any given time, there was only maybe nine or ten people on the project between the three practices. So we approached it as a kind of think tank, best idea wins. And that was from everything from the big idea to that rope. You know, like it was always the three of us in a room working together, working through all those. Um, that, was the, that was the part that got, you know, that was, that was challenging, um, you know, to kind of always, you know, get together and be challenged by each other. I mean, we learned a lot from each other. It was a great experience. It was a 10-year project, so it went on for a while. Um, and, you know, we're pretty happy going there. Um, it was... Uh, it's a pretty, re pretty rewarding project to do. Great. Well, thank you again, Wendell.